Okay. We'll come to order. May I have a roll call, please? Andorino? Here. Border? Here. Kane? Here. Sun? Here. Smolka? Here. Shupai? Here. Long? Here. The, uh, the mission of School District 15 is to produce world-class learners by building a connected learning community. This evening we're going to be led in the pledge by some special people and Meg Schnorr is going to introduce them. Okay, good evening. Dr. Thompson, President Shupai, members of the Board of Education. In April of 2017, Dr. Thompson approached myself and Dr. Wolfel about a very exciting opportunity that we had uh, that was provided by Northrop Grumman for two of our students to attend space camp in Huntsville, Alabama. So it was a very exciting opportunity. And we had to um, go to our teaching staff to find out who the best and the brightest would be. And we really targeted a couple of young ladies this time to be able to have this opportunity to go down to space camp. So Heather Howard is here with us tonight. She's a fifth grade teacher at Jane Addams and she accompanied the two young ladies on uh, their trip of a lifetime to Huntsville for space camp. So I'm going to turn it over to Heather. Hello all, this is, I'm, my name's Heather Howard, I teach fifth grade, and this is Leslie, who's an eighth grade student, and we were lucky enough, thank you ahead of time to the district and everyone here for helping us get to space camp in Huntsville, Alabama. When we were there, we basically did some basic astronaut training. While there, I learned that this generation of students will be the students that will get us to Mars. So we have a great participant that went there, learned a lot. Some things that we did, we did some zero gravity training where I had to fix some broken solar panels. Did you have to do the same thing? No. no. Did, were you in mission control? Yeah. So she helped the crew communicate, whereas I was and a space suit, which was super hot. We had to wear some cooling pads to make sure we didn't overheat. But a lot of STEM activities and uh, a trip that we will never forget. We capped off our, our trip with getting on a plane by American Airlines and meeting some very, very nice pilots where I got to brag about the two students that went with us. And they actually let us sit in the cockpit of the plane. And they were also very, very enthused to meet one of the students here, Leslie, and they also could tell that they're gonna do bright things in their future. So thank you again for allowing us to go. So now we're going to say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, Heather and Leslie. Thank you. Thank you all for coming this evening. We will commence the public hearing on the adoption of the fiscal year 2018 tentative budget. Yeah. May I have a motion, please? Make a motion to open the public hearing on the adoption of the fiscal year 2018 tentative budget. Second. Second the motion. Roll call. Ann Reno? Aye. Border? Aye. Kane? Aye. Khan? Aye. Smolka? Aye. Shupai? Aye. Wong? Aye. The motion carries. Uh, are there any board inquiries or questions? The, uh, we will now open this hearing to comments from members of the public. Kindly note the following. Please remember that this is not a dialogue between you and the board. If you have a specific issue which requires a response, Superintendent Thompson will get back to you. Additionally, please note that this comment period is only on the issue of the adoption of the fiscal year 2018 tentative budget. Public comment on any other issue should be held until the appropriate segment of the regular meeting following this hearing. Does anyone wish to comment or have any questions related to the fiscal year 2018 tentative budget? 
they, uh, they should feel free to do that too uh, after Mike's presentation. Um, Mike, are, are you going to make a presentation? Or your, your, your slides are up there, so. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, the, the slides I have there are from what we presented to the board. Good evening, by the way. I'm sorry. Good evening. Uh, we presented to the board in July. We've made no changes at, at, at this point. Um, um, we will bring all the final changes to the board for uh, final adoption at our September meeting, which I think is September 13, 12, 13. Um, biggest unknown at this point, I just I will point out, we're still anticipating a school aid budget <laughs> for 17, 18. Um, as um, I'm not sure everybody knows, but the governor did amendatorily veto parts of the budget. Um, and then we heard that even in his amendatory veto, there were some major erroneous flaws in, in the analysis that the governor's office put out. So our, the agencies that we work with are current analyzing that, currently analyzing that, so we really don't know what, what effect that would have on our district at this point. So we're just waiting to hear um, to where it stands right now. The Senate has until August 16 to, to act on, on the governor's veto. They can either um, accept his changes as, as is, they can vote to override it, or if they do nothing, the bill fails and there is no school aid budget for next year. And then whatever happens in the Senate then has to ha happen in the House as well. So we're just kind of waiting with bated breath at this time to see what happens um, with, our, with our school aid budget for next year. And then we'll bring all final changes once we hire all staff, which um, Lisa Nuss and, and Matt Barbini are, are diligently working on. Once we have all that settled um, and all of our numbers in place, then we'll bring, bring all those changes to the board in September. So you haven't really made any changes since your June presentation? That's correct. Uh, all the assumptions you used are the same? Correct. And uh, this will be on file for people to uh, look it's at? It's on display and in, in our office. comments, right, mm -hmm. for the next month. And then uh, if any changes are made, you'll present those to the board in September. We will have changes. We will present those, correct. Great. Great. So, Mike, then in September, you will present changes. Will you present the full presentation so that the, uh, or will it only be adjustments that were made from? Normally what I've done in the past is I've just presented what the adjustments are and what effect it has on the bottom line. Okay. If, if the board wants a full presentation, I'd be happy to do that as well. Okay. Any public comment? All right, then uh, we have a motion to adjourn the public hearing. I make a motion to adjourn the public hearing on the adoption of the fiscal year 2018 tentative budget. Second? Second. The, uh, the public hearing is adjourned. Thank you. The next uh, section is mine, and I just want to go over a few items. I presented the board with some information about uh, the beginning of the school year and some the current status of the <coughs> engagement planning committee. Uh, we've got probably over uh, 12,000 children that have gathered up school supplies by now. Um, the girls probably have their clothes laid out for the first week. It starts next Wednesday. Um, but I think uh, people are anticipating the start of school uh, and looking forward to it, kids, parents, and staff members. Um, to begin with, the, the Community Engagement Planning Committee is continuing to meet, and they are progressing. And as I stated in the uh, memo that I gave you, they are hoping to, to facilitate three or four community forums uh, during the upcoming school year. Probably going to shoot for three, I think, because uh, in order for us to plan and prepare, uh, publicize, it's going to probably not start until October, and we'll probably get two more in before the end of the school year. But those can continue if necessary. And the committee's uh, excited about offering those forums to the community, getting feedback from them, and finding other ways as well to elicit feedback <coughs> from the community on their priorities and, and what they'd like us to be working on. So um, I'll have Matt come at, at a future meeting to give you an update, but I think we're shooting for an October uh, community forum, and the topic will be decided by the committee based upon feedback that they've received already from the community, and somebody from my staff will make that presentation depending on the topic. And uh, they also will determine the best time for that, whether it's an evening is the best time or a weekend. So they'll be working on that and getting us back to you. But I'll let you know about uh, the Community Engagement Planning Committee. Uh, I provided you with uh, a number of pieces of information about the uh, beginning of the school year, the curricular things that will happen. Uh, probably at this point, uh, what you should know is that the enrollment is pretty much status quo. At this point, it looks like um, things are going to level out unless some kids exit or some kids have a mass entrance. I think we're going to be approximately where we were last year. 
about the same number of staff. That's what we're looking at right now. Same number of uh, certified teaching staff that we had last year with this up upcoming school year. We did have, I think the number's grown to almost uh, over 50 new teachers that participated in a week-long training of uh, new teacher orientation. Um, Mr. Board and Mr. Kong were, Kong were able to be at the luncheon, saw many of those uh, young, youthful faces. <laughs> um, but they're excited, and we've, we've kind of provided them with the information necessary to hit the ground running, and the Department of Instruction under Meg's uh, supervision really did a nice job with running that new teacher orientation. A uh, number of curricular high points that are going to be an emphasis for the school year that I showed you about. Uh, math, science, English. Um, got some new things, uh, pilot materials in K2. Um, the district-wide professional development focus will really be upon uh, school improvement and our Chromebooks this year. We have the one-to-one -one rollout for 6th through 8th graders. All of them will receive Chromebooks. That's been a, a massive task to get those all ready. But, uh, Matt and the technology department have uh, done a nice job getting those all ready. We're uh, migrating to new, new uh, email addresses for all the kids, and um, they'll all have some information on the cloud that they can store, so it's, we're excited about that. Uh, tomorrow is an innovation summit that's occurring, and we'll have over 200 teachers and staff at an innovation summit learning how that they can use um, the Chromebooks and other technology to enhance and engage students in a more effective manner. So that's, that's going to be exciting. Um, the last thing is that I provided you with the draft of the board goals for the upcoming school year. This was a result of our retreat in July, and uh, with Meg's help, we crafted these goals for your comment and consideration. Typically what we do, if, if uh, are there any changes made by the board tonight, we'll make those and then we'll post these on the website for a, a month and allow for uh, community members to comment as well on what they, what they think about our goals. Did anybody see anything that they wanted to modify, change, didn't jive? The only thing I saw was the there's a couple of them that don't have a time frame associated with the the result, uh, the strategic plan or the, the learning and organizational development topic and the the research resource stewardship just had a sort of a plan created goal without a specific time frame associated with it. So I think it'd be good to clarify, even if it's approximate. Yeah, I think um, that will take shape over the next month. I think um, we have been talking about. Uh, process to develop a strategic plan and trying to figure out um, how to get information from the board and what they think about that. But um, Morgan has contacted someone from District 220, previous um, uh, chief communication officer in District 220, who's facilitated a community, um, a community process for coming up with a strategic plan. And um, he is now living in Texas, but he's willing to come up and do that for us as well. And the process was that <clears throat> it, it took place over Friday night, all day Saturday, and then Sunday morning. And we, they invited in over, I think, 200 residents and community members, business leaders, politicians, parents, uh, teaching staff, administrators, board members. Uh, over 200 of them met for those, uh, you know, probably 10 hours or so. And at the end of the time, they had enough information to develop a strategic plan that's still in place. And that, that uh, was, that process took place, I think, maybe, what, eight or ten years ago? About eight years ago. Eight years ago. So um, I was going to bounce that off the board, see what they thought, and uh, probably give the Community Engagement Planning Committee a little time to get some information from uh, their forums. But maybe we could we could have the strategic plan in the spring. Uh, is that too late, do you think? Or? No, no, no. Ideally, as long as it's in place by the end of the school year. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, I think that's what we'll, we'll go for then. I'll get in touch with uh, Jeff down in Texas and we'll um, see if we can arrange those dates sometime in the spring. And then we'll attach a date to this date. But thanks for that. <coughs> I, I think I agree with Barb that even just attaching a date that's the end of the school year is viable with the goal that. You know, there will be milestones prior, um, but something complete and ready to go at the end of the school year. We'll probably have the same. Uh, the resource stewardship will probably be something that will be kind of rolling, but we should have something by, by certainly by the end of the school year, uh, probably more like uh, 
I think February because we have to start planning for construction the next summer. Um, and so we should have some kind of plan to the board to show uh, what we're planning on doing. I think one of my comments on that one too is that that one's sort of circular in that the piece before talking about curricular and program improvements and, and looking largely across all of our facilities and our enrollment and things like that, one sort of feeds into the other. So I think it's all sort of got to be taken in tandem, but we can't rush one piece until we have some of the others Not completed. Right. Yep, that's very insightful. I <coughs> so any questions about my section tonight? Okay. All right. Uh, may I have a motion for the acceptance of minutes, please? Mm -hmm. Make a motion to approve the minutes from the following meetings of the Board of Education. June 14, 2017, the regular Board of Education meeting. July 13, 2017, the Board of Education meeting, uh, the Board of Education and District Team Leadership Retreat. Second. I second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Kane? Aye. Kern? Aye. Smolka? Aye. Shuprai? Aye. Wong? Aye. Annarino? Aye. Order? Aye. Motion carries. <coughs> um, if anyone would like to address the board, the, uh, these forms are available out on the table in the hallway. If you fill it out and turn it into Mrs. Becker, that would be great. Um, at this point, we'll move on to uh, board discussion and reports. Uh, Ed Red, Mr. Anarino. Uh, with regards to Ed Red, uh, Mike kind of stole my thunder already. <laughs> yeah. I apologize. That's all right. So uh, Senate Bill 1 well, was sat on for about two months uh, after it was approved by both houses, uh, evidently in an attempt to, I think, squeeze the governor a little bit. Uh, to, to, so he didn't have as much time to deal with it. And then when he, uh, he did get it, he did the mandatory veto, and now they have 15 days to act on it, otherwise the bill ends up being dead. That holds up all the, uh, the state funding money for the schools. Um, the idea behind the mandatory veto was to try to um, not let the Chicago public schools permanently embed uh, their uh, lump sum funding that they've been getting every year, which is like 20, you know, 200 million dollars, because that skews the funding formula. So that that was the rationale behind that. There's some other stuff in there, but that seems to be the big one that everybody's uh, uh, hung up on. And uh, the idea behind that is so that the poor uh, districts throughout the state of Illinois would actually get more money if the Chicago public school funding was not permanently made part of the uh, evidence-based formula. So that's about it in a nutshell. Thanks, Frank. Quickly got a good handle on that. Thank you. That was good. <laughs> the, uh, Mike, would you like to comment in terms of effect? I know you kind of insinuated as you, as you spoke, but effect or lack thereof on the beginning of our school year and the first couple of months of school. <clears throat> well, from a, if we look at the school aid, Standpoint. So we, District 15 receives about $14.5 million of state aid. Plus transportation, which is about another $4.2 million. Transportation is really out of Senate Bill 1. So all, it appears we would still get the transportation reimbursement. It would be the $14.5 million of state aid that we wouldn't get. So that would obviously create a big hole in our budget. We hear a lot of we hear a lot of districts in the state may only be able to stay open for about four or five weeks before they run out of cash. Well, those are districts that are highly dependent on general state aid. District 15 gets about 10 million dollars in general state aid. About 78 percent of our revenue in our district comes from property taxes. So actually, since July 1 through the first week in August, we've already received about 43 million dollars in, in tax receipts. Mm -hmm. So as Mr. Baltimore and I have looked at it, easily we could get through March with with, uh, um, with our schools being open. If there's no school aid bill whatsoever, then probably, and we haven't really pushed the numbers yet, if we if push came to shove, you know, we really have to sharpen our pencils and, and look at how we pay bills, we could probably get through, the, through all of next school year um, with, with our cash reserves that we have because we have a strong fund balance in the way property taxes come in. So we're not too, we're not worried about being able to get through a vast majority of the school district, uh, the school year I should say, without a school aid bill. Um, if not the entire school, the whole, the whole school year. But then if that goes into 18, 19, that's a whole different story where we would be at that point. Um, and Dr. Thompson and I, it, it have, we, we've talked in, 
if you think about over 850 districts in the state of Illinois, so many of them are dependent, especially those districts downstate. If they don't stay open, you know, more than four or five weeks, then it's really chaos in the state. So that's why we say we're reasonably optimistic there's got to be some kind of bill that comes out of uh, Springfield that, that distributes the money to the, the yeah, as Mr. Andorino said, the uh, evidence-based funding model, which is Senate Bill 1, to the school district. So um, we've got to believe there's something that's going to come within the next, we hope, two weeks. And isn't there a possibility that, you know, just overall they do some sort of temporary, in the case of this still, you know, the political football being thrown around, that there's some sort of temporary funding that they that they approve of, you know, in, in the interim? It well, like that's how they get a lot of stuff done. Yeah, I just read today that one, one idea that's being floated in Springfield is there would be a, a, a lawsuit filed, and the lawsuit would say that, the current for funding formula that was in place in 1617 would also apply in 1718, and then they would leave it to the courts to figure out what they do with the evidence-based funding model. So if that were to happen, then we would probably would get our, so the way Senate Bill 1 works is no district gets less money in 1718 than it received in 1617. So under Senate Bill 1, we're basically the same $14.5 million of state aid under Senate Bill 1 as we are um, in 1617. So if that lawsuit were to happen, we'd still get the $14.5 million. Under Governor Rauner's plan, the preliminary numbers we saw, we'd get about an extra $350,000 out of if, if his plan with his amendatory veto stays. However, again, as I had mentioned earlier, that they had a, a major flaw in that, which was um, they counted into our, our, our basic funding model the value of TIF districts. So the way a TIF district works is all the, the tax receipts that come out of a TIF district go to the local municipality to fund the improvements within the TIF district. We have, I think, five, five TIFs in, in District 15. So they count that as our as, as local adequacy effort, which we really can't access that money. So when we hear about the erroneous flaw that came out of the governor's office, that's, that's the major part they're talking about, is, is, is counting the, the value of the TIF districts in our, in our ability to, to, to fund our schools, which we cannot access, any school district can't access that. And I think in the city of Chicago, there's like 237 TIF districts within the city of Chicago alone. So there's, there's a lot of issues that are still out there um, that, that need to be determined. So again, long story short, uh, you know, from a cash flow standpoint, we're, we're fine at this point. We'll be at least through March, if not the whole school year, and hopefully by then we'll know what's going on. Perfect. So I think, uh, thank you, Mike. Um, I think this particular situation emphasizes why it's uh, important that the district has kept about 30 to 35 percent of its annual budget in reserves so that we can absorb some of these things when they happen. Um, don't always happen, but when they do, we're in a good position. It's a modest amount, up to 30 to 35 percent. Uh, there are some school districts in the suburban area that have 100 to 200 percent of their annual reserve, uh, annual budget in reserves. That that's pretty unreasonable to, you know, to put in a savings account taxpayer money at that level. But but 30 to 35 percent is very reasonable, and and it's, it shows now why that's that's got sound fiscal planning and it helps us get through some of these times. Great. <clears throat> one Five Foundation, this is a quick update. So right now the One Five Foundation is in um, a brainstorming mode for fundraising ideas. So for those who don't know it, um, the foundation gives between twelve and $13,000 out every year to fund all kinds of cool activities, programs, um, buy supplies, all things that our students benefit from. Um, but in addition to that money that they give out, it costs about $12,000 to just bare bones manage the foundation. So we look to raise about $25,000 per year to keep the foundation working and be able to keep doing all the good that we're doing. So that means fundraising. Last year we had a couple really cool fundraisers that were really well received. There was a volleyball tournament and an event at Dirty Nelly. So now we're kind of in brainstorming mode to figure out what are some good fundraising ideas for the current school year so we can keep giving. So if anybody has any great ideas they want to share, feel free to reach out. Thank you. Um, the uh, Finance Committee, Mr. Wong or Mr. Border? Uh, first meeting's planned for September, so no update at this time. Okay. Perhaps during this time, though, we could get a report from the members that are on the negotiating teams about how negotiations are going. Perfect. Okay, for the ESPA negotiations, it's going to uh, re engage a mediator. So uh, the first meeting was supposed to be tomorrow, but that got canceled because so the, the mediator had to go and uh, attend to 
a mediation where there was a work stoppage. So that was more important than us. So uh, we're, we're that meeting, our first meeting with the mediator is going to be on the 22nd of August. And uh, with regard to uh, SEIU, we've had uh, a couple initial meetings. Uh, we exchanged proposals at this point in time, so we are waiting to hear back from a counter proposal. And hopefully we've got a couple more meetings scheduled, and hopefully we can move it along and uh, get some results quickly. Good deal. Um, I, I'm going to kick back over to the uh, the date on the when you decide on the meeting date for the finance committee. Can you just shoot it out to everybody so we know when? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you for the negotiation updates. Uh, equity committee, Mr. Khan. So the last uh, month or so, hasn't been uh, with school. I mean, the first uh, at the last uh, month or so of, of school, we spent to just gather information from the principal and to visit the schools. We got a lot of information during that time. The next step is for us to, uh, you know, as school is starting, I don't, know, I don't know if it's the best time to visit the remaining schools right in this first initial time period. We're just trying to, you know, get everything, uh, uh, you know, put together in the beginning of the year. But, so I think we're going to use that time to, we should use that time to um, go ahead and speak to the administrators on looking at some of the data. So we can kind of compare what the data says compared to what we're seeing on the ground. One thing is in the, in the interim, we did have this uh, board retreat, and it was uh, illuminating to see that a lot of people had the same concerns as what this committee was initially set up for, just as, you know, without even, you know, we, we were talking, uh, that became almost the number one uh, issue that people wanted the board to work on was this uh, perceived or, or actual achievement gap and to, to study it and to improve on it. So that just, I think, can serve as a, you know, as a bolster to the committee's efforts and I look forward to meeting with the, with the administration to talk about the data. I'll reach out to, to you guys to um, set, set that up. And then after that, we'll continue with the visiting of this, the remaining schools because I, I haven't gone to each, each of the schools yet. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Superintendent's Communication Committee, Mr. Smoka or Mr. Khan? At this point, we are uh, in the process of making plans, so we have nothing to report this time. Thank you very much. Um, moving on to Citizens Address the Board. Uh, we will now open our meeting for public comment. Please remember that this is not a dialogue between you and the board. If you have a specific issue which requires a response, Superintendent Thompson will get back to you. Please state your name and identify any group that you represent. Limit your remarks to no more than five minutes. If someone previously has articulated something with which you agree, please state that you agree rather than reiterating the entire comment. Finally, avoid any comments specific to a person, student, or staff member respecting the right to privacy. This is not the forum to comment on personnel issues. Thanks. Jess, uh, Jen Westberg. Okay, so I saw you use two different microphones, so which one do I go to? Come to this Whichever one, right? Like. <laughs> <laughs> um, Good evening. Um, good evening, Dr. Tom Dr. Thompson and President Shukai and the members of the Board of Education. Um, my name is Jen Westberg, and I have an incoming fourth grader and second grader at Thomas Jefferson Elementary School. I am also an educator in a neighboring school district. And this evening, I would like to address two unresolved issues that our district is currently facing. And first is the need for all day kindergarten. As a kindergarten teacher, I can tell you the difference between half day kindergarten and all day kindergarten. During a full day program, children have the opportunity for play-based learning, which naturally develops their curiosity as learners and their risk-taking skills. Five-year-olds need space to socialize and to build those social-emotional skills so that they can have a strong foundation in school. All-day programs provide a balance between academics, social, and emotional development. Young children need time to work on self-regulating, their own emotions, problem solving, as well as developing their independence, which simply builds their own confidence. 
currently, I know that you as a board are working on strengthening our bullying policy. I will tell you as an educator, I know it's not something that we can just um, eliminate, but I do think that um, there is a way for us to be proactive, and that is to continue to build um, confidence in our students so that they can become the bystanders in situations and diffuse the control of a bully. This starts when they are young and is built upon every single school year. Second, um, I'm asking that we align our middle school with our high school so that there is a continuous opportunities for all teenagers. Um, this will give an even playing field for all freshmen entering from high school. The alignment helps with a sense of community and just the continuation of academics because different schools do have different expectations and requirements. Also, um, by doing this, we shorten the um, time that middle schoolers are on the bus in my neighborhood, which is currently 45 minutes. And we all know nothing hap like good happens on a school bus, and especially with middle schoolers. And um, when we decrease the um, bus ride to lower, we are lowering opportunities for students to be bullied, also get into mischief. My hope would be that, you know. Um, neighboring communities have already kind of, like caught on to these opportunities and have been working on the alignment between their middle schools and high schools and as well have been working on um, creating opportunities for all day kindergarten, whether it's a fee-based program or it's um, created in a different way. Um, our community wants this to be a priority for the next school year. Um, we feel like the job of the school board is to support and be advocates for the children in our community, and you've been elected by our community, and we are looking for all day kindergarten and also the alignment between middle school and high schools. Um, we want to be proactive in our children's education. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Jenny Bartkus. Hello, my name is Jenny Barkis. I am an Amerian Jordan parent of a rising third grader, but I'm here to represent a group of parents who support their rising third graders. We first want to say that Marion Jordan has a wonderful staff. They're dedicated, they're hardworking, they're smart, they're kind, they're nice, and they care about our kids. But we've noticed a flaw in the system that we want to talk about, and this flaw creates inequities across the district. The two handouts that were distributed um, are, the one is a presentation that we prepared for Dr. Thompson and Dr. Barbini, and when we met with Dr. Barbini, that was the information we discussed. And the other is research from benefits of having a small class size. So I want to discuss the formula used to allocate class sizes. And in going through all of this, um, the group of parents that I've worked with, we've discovered four different flaws. The first flaw is that class size target in District 15 is 24 students per class when the state average is 22. The second is that the formula uses grade spans um, as opposed to considering each grade level independently to determine those number of sections a school receives. So that flaw impacts small schools much more significantly than larger schools. So for example, if a school has four sections in a grade and gains four students, it does not impact class size as much as a school who gains four <laughs> students but only has two sections. The third flaw is that Marion Jordan hosts the SIP program, and we love having these kids at our school, but those children aren't considered in the number determining the class sizes to determine the FTE, those full-time equivalency, you know, one teacher that a school receives. We would love to see those students counted. 
And the fourth um, flaw we noticed is the formula defines a target, but it doesn't establish a cap in either direction. So our children last year as second graders ended the year in two sections at 30 in one class and 29 in another, which is basically 25% higher than that target. We believe these inequities result in learning loss for students. So we're suggesting four modifications. One is to set the target to the state average. Two is to look at the grade levels individually instead of as grade spans. Three is to include students in the specialized programming in the count when it's possible. And four, set that plus or minus cap for the target and apply it objectively and consistently across the district. We're requesting that the formula be modified to mitigate inequities and diminish the subjective decision making that occurs due to these flaws in the formula. Our specific children have had large class sizes their entire career in District 15. And so the next thing I want to talk about is the benefits of these smaller class sizes. There's a project that was done a while ago, research, called the Tennessee Star Project, and that's where I've gotten my information from. The Tennessee Star Project documents that smaller class sizes, kindergarten through third grade, had a positive and long-lasting impact on children, their education, and their long-term success. Their cognitive learning was measured by standardized test scores for reading and math, and those were much higher than those of their peer groups who had larger class sizes. The results from the Tennessee Star Project also found there was no impact introducing an aid to the classroom for class sizes greater than 21. The results from the Tennessee Star Project also found there was no impact introducing an aid to the classroom for class sizes larger than 21. But we don't only, you know, we care more about, excuse me, it's more than just the tests. It is the whole child, the whole student. And developing um, behaviors and refining an understanding of what it means to be a student is also really important. They're learning how to collaborate with others, cooperate, function in a group setting, and be responsible to themselves and others. Developing these essential lifelong skills thought to have been most successful in smaller class settings with a dedicated certified teacher because there were fewer distractions. So in keeping with the mission of District 15 and the world class education, we truly hope that you will look at the class sizes as well as the formula flaws that we're bringing up. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Samaya Hefferon. Am I close with your first name? Samia. Samia. Thank you. That's all right. <laughs> I had a couple of different thoughts in my head, but it's not a common name. So my name is Samia Heffern, and I am speaking on behalf of a group of Mary and Jordan third grade parents. And what I'd really like to talk with you guys today is about class size, specifically about the experience of our third graders over time in District 15. Mary and Jordan parents have talked with Mrs. Grosh about our class size for several years. We've also had more than one conversation with Dr. Barbini, Mrs. Grosh, and Dr. Swanland. In our meeting that just ended a couple of hours ago, we were informed that our request for a third section at third grade was being denied. We are deeply disappointed. And I still would like to present what I was going to present before I had that information. As we speak, Mrs. Burkus and I, as, as she said, aren't talking as two people. We represent 61 parents of the 44, of 44 Mary and Jordan third graders. We are representing 70% of the third graders enrolled in that school. In front of you is a petition that they have all signed requesting a third class at third grade for our students for this year. Our students have been well over the district target every year of their career in District 15. In this petition, we explain what we believe the impacts have been on our students from high class sizes over consecutive years. Mrs. Barkas also shared research 
that shows that, that class size matters. We didn't get to share all of our thoughts and opinions and feelings with administration before the, administ before the decision was made that our request was not being granted. So we hope you will consider that information and have dialogue with administration. In speaking with administration, it was explained to us that another section could not be allocated because then another section would have to be allocated to every third grade that was three over the target. We believe that linear problem solving process is part of the reason that we have all of the inequities that we have in class size across the district. The second document in front of you is a set of graphs and it shows the experience of the of third grade cohorts across the district. The information on those graphs for kindergarten, first and second grade all comes from board documents. The information from third grade, because those haven't been posted, because um, obviously there's a lot of mobility right now in schools, that information came from us calling the schools in the last few days and saying, how many kids do you have in third grade? So that's as accurate as it was the day we called, but all of those calls were made within the last couple of days. In the graphs, we only included class sizes that were over the target because that has been our children's experience and that it helps us illustrate our points. Mary and Jordan is the only third grade group that has target, started the year over target every year. If you look at the graph, the horizontal lines represent the 24th student target for first through third grade. When looking at kindergarten, remember that the target is 20. If you look at the Marion Jordan experience, the flaws that Mrs. Barkas talked about become readily apparent. We ended kindergarten at 22 and 22. The target is 20. In first grade, we started at 25 and 26. We ended at 29 and 30. That shows the impact of moving students on small schools. If we had three or four sections and eight first graders moved in, our class sizes would not have jumped so quickly. In second grade, we started at the highest class size for second grade in the district with 28. This year we're starting with, um, and that 28 and 28 grew to 29 and 30. This year we're starting with 27 and 28, which is the second highest third grade class size in all of the elementary schools. Mary and Jordan hosts the Structured Instructional Program. Those children are included in our general education classes. We welcome them. We feel they need to be counted. Those numbers that I shared with you do not include those children. In comparing our class size to other schools, the two schools that come close to our third grade experience would be Pleasant Hill and Paddock, and you have those graphs. Pleasant Hill and Paddock have been over target two years, while Mary and Jordan's class of third grade has been over target for four years. Pleasant Hill and Paddock don't have the instructional programming that has gen special education children included with the significant needs that Mary and Jordan has. Pleasant Hill and Paddock are also starting with three and four sections respectively. So even if we're starting close to them now, when we get more kids, our class size is gonna go up much more significantly than theirs because we don't have place to put our children. In our conversations with administration, we talked about things like space, and we talked about what would happen if we added a section in terms of art, music, and PE. In our opinion, all of those are solvable Stephanie, circumstances. Wind, wind up, okay. okay. Um, in, all of, in our opinion, all of those are solvable circumstances. We disagree with the administration's decision. We request that you consider all of this information. We believe our children have been feeded uh, treated inequitably and they deserve the world-class education that all District 15 students receive. On behalf of the 61 parents on the petition that represent 44 students or 70% of the Marion Jordan third grade class, we'd like to thank the school board for your public service and we hope you consider our request and we look forward to a response. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Valerie Morrison.
I just wanted to quickly address the board that something has come up that I just wanted to just quickly um, discuss, and that is that I'm, first of all, very excited that we have added Chromebooks to the junior highs and the sixth grade, the one-on-one. -on -one. I think that is very, very exciting for everyone in the district. Um, my concern is, is that while the junior highs have retained a full-time library slash tech position, that the elementary positions are being cut in half this year. And that um, I am concerned that this will cut the support at the elementary level. Um, I think that technology and education is our future. And I ask the board to consider how teachers um, really need the support at the building level. It's very important that teachers feel that they have someone there and that there's someone there for them to rely on. And while it's Again, it's very, very exciting that we have all new technologies, but that we really have to consider that support is also very, very important. So I just ask that the board considers this when I know this is something that's new that's happening um, this year, but again, that this is something that I think is just something important for us to be thinking about um, because, again, it's, it's, it's not going away. Technology is, is here to stay, and we are going to continue and to continue to evolve. I think it's also important for us to make sure that we have um, the tools and the um, technology in place for the teachers and then in turn students to succeed. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Victoria Findish. Can you pronounce your last name please? It's Findus. Findus. Yeah. That's okay though. Um, good evening. Thank you um, for letting us speak to you tonight. I wanted to talk about the same issue that Jen Westberg just spoke and presented about um, with regards to aligning the junior high to the high school district. I have four students at Thomas Jefferson Elementary, a sixth grader, a fourth grader, a third grader, and a kindergartner. And um, I feel that it is important that they are able to stay a part of the community that they will be rejoined with when they go to high school. Currently, they'll go to Sandberg Junior High. Um, my understanding is that, from talking with other community members, is that there's about 50, 50 students from Thomas Jefferson that go to Sandberg. Um, and just kind of wondering if you, the board would look at absorbing those students into Palm Grove Junior High, where the Palm Grove Junior High students would also return to friends. Um, I'm also kind of just wondering what the enrollment capacity is at Palm Grove compared to Sandberg and what the capacity is at now to see if that's even feasible. I know we talk about um, our community is wondering about redrawing the boundaries, um, and I know that that's a big task. But if absorbing the TJ students into the Plum Grove enrollment would help in making some of your decisions to keep our kids in the communities where they're going to be transitioning through their educational experience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, that's, that's definitely one of our goals that we have proposed is to look at utilizing the space we have, the boundaries, what our projections are going to be in the future. So um, I think we will have some more answers about that. I um, can tell you that Plum Grove is, is over capacity. It's really bursting at the seams. And there are about 250 kids that matriculate to uh, high school from, from Sandburg. And probably... Um, I think I think that there's maybe well I have to get the numbers but it's I think there are there are um, about a 50 50 split I think about who goes to Framd and who goes to Rolling Meadows so but I'll get you that information. All right. Thank you, Jane Van Wolveler. Good evening. I came this evening to actually simply observe and saw something on the agenda that I would like clarification on, if nothing else. Um, coming up on the agenda reads, approval of Illinois Association School Board Annual Conference Registration and Housing. Is that conference in Chicago this year again? 
Okay. I simply want to remind everybody on this board that probably about six years ago, many people stepped forward and spoke up regarding paying for hotel rooms for board members during this conference and that the community was feeling that this is not being fiscally conservative with the tax dollars when we have a train that goes from Palatine, downtown Chicago. There should be no need to house every school board member for one or two nights at our tax dollar cost or expenses, I should say. So keep that in mind, whatever decision you make, remember, in the past, multiple people have come up. I didn't anticipate bringing this up at all. I simply saw it and wanted to speak up for those who spoke up in the past. And the other thing that this woman just brought up that brought something into my mind, I recently read that the Motorola campus is going to be developed into residential um, this, you know, housing. I don't know if it's single family. I don't know what the plan is. I simply want to know if 15 is actively looking into how that can impact us, what provisions we might be able to put on the developer if it's going to add multiple children. Will they provide land on that area for a possible school or donate X number of dollars for the additional classrooms we may have to create. My, my whole thought process is let's be proactive before this even starts to get built and not have to react to, oh my God, what are we gonna do with all these kids? So for what that's worth, that's what I'd ask you guys <coughs> to look out for all of us if that should happen. Thank you. Thanks, Jan. Jay Basra. Uh, thank you, board members, for your time. First of all, I, the issue that I have at hand is more of a personal issue, so I just want to address the fact that uh, this might be concerning other parents also. I have a uh, nine-year-old who's going to be in fifth grade at Lincoln. She's been denied interdistrict transfer uh, this year. While she had been provided that interdistrict transfer for second, third, and fourth grade. Um, I informed her today that the second request was denied today, and her response was, made me cry. She's like, ah. I have to make new friends. You know, um, this is not something that's easy. Uh, if it's affecting other kids socially, uh, psychologically, you know, educationally, it's something to be considered. That you can't just take a kid and say, hey, go here today, and next year you're going to go to this other school. If you're going to give somebody the right to be able to attend a school, build those relationships, don't just like throw them around. Thank you. That's it. We will move on to action items. Item 17820, the uh, personnel report. May I have a motion, please? Make a motion to approve the August 9, 2017, 2017 personnel report, including the following recommendations. Recommendation for discipline, one day unpaid suspension for James Duffy. Second. Discussion? Roll call. Con. Aye. Smolka? Aye. Shupai? Aye. Wong? Aye. Anarino? Aye. Border? Aye. Kane? Aye. Motion carries. 17821. Approval of Illinois Association of School Boards Annual Conference Registration and Housing. I make a motion to approve the associated cost registration and housing for the Illinois Association of School Boards Annual Conference attendees. A second. Discussion? Roll call. Smolka? Aye. Shupai? Aye. Wong? Aye. Anarino? Aye. Border? Aye. Kane? Aye. Khan? Aye. Motion carries. 
Item 17823, the bid award for general office paper and art supplies. I make a motion to award the contract for the general office paper and art supplies, bid 17-019 to school specialty in Appleton, Wisconsin for a one-year anticipated total contract amount that's estimated to be $500,000. Recommendations are based on the vendor's ability to best meet the needs of the district with manufacturer discounts, rebate incentives, delivery service, and their selection of products. Second. Second. Any discussion? Uh, yeah, I had some questions about it. Um, I was looking at some of the numbers, and I don't know if it's just the way they, they bid on it, but some of the items seemed like incongruent. Like some numbers were really low and some numbers were really high. And I, I was kind of wondering how that, how that happened. Like for instance, they had some stuff on here for paper, and, and one guy was quoting you know, like $1.72, and another one was quoting $38.37. I mean, it was like a large disparity. I was kind of wondering how that happens. It's, it's a different bid we've done this year. So what we've done in the past is we've warehoused all these items in our warehouse. And we said that's really an inefficient way to do it because we get a box of pens, box of pencils, delivered to the warehouse, and somebody requisitions it out of the warehouse, puts it on a truck, truck drives it out to the building and gives it to the school building. So what we wanted to do this year is go to a just-in-time inventory system, which many other districts, my former district, we did it about 10 years ago. So we, we put together what we normally order on a uh, on an annual basis. And what will happen now is when the building's put in an order, instead of it being delivered to the warehouse and then we have a, a district employee delivered to the building, within 24 hours will be delivered directly to the building. So we have to look at all items. So before we would, we would look at every single item and split a bid up. But this one we couldn't split up because we, we only wanted to give it to one vendor for the just-in-time. So there are in some cases where a vendor may have been lower on one or two or three items, but we looked at what vendor gave us the best price on the majority of the items. So that's why you may see some that are lower in some instances, but we looked at it in an entirety other than just as a, as a single item basis. Okay. But I mean, some of them are just like <clears throat> really seem way out of whack. Yeah, if you could... If you point those out, we can figure it out. Uh, okay. Give us a little time to figure that out. Yeah, because some of them look just wrong, like off by, you know, magnitude. So. And some of it could be the quantity of it, too. So what we did, we looked at what, you know. And that's what I was wondering. Like, yeah. the quantities weren't right? Because the spreadsheet shows them as all being the same, but one of them clear. I mean, some of them are clearly not. I mean, they're talking about, you know, like Elmer's glue costing $36 a bottle. I'm like, that, something's wrong. Yeah, sometimes the bidders incorrectly put prices in there as well, so um, it could be just a bidder. Yeah, I'm just kind of wondering, it's like, is this really what we're, we're going to be paying, or is this somebody made a mistake? Well, we'll look at it, I'd have to look at specifically, it's probably something like that, it's probably like per case, because, you yeah, know, that's why it's one thing. For $36 a bottle. Yeah, I don't know, yeah. Outrageous, yeah. I don't know, it's just one of those things where it's like, hey, so let's take a look at this stuff, and I'm looking at it, and I'm going, whoa, what's going on with some of this stuff, you know, like, you know, a, a dry erase marker costing $10. That's another one that's it's probably on the quantity limit. Yeah. So that's why I'm like. But the thing is, though, they still multiplied them out. So, you know. I'll leave you my paper copies, and you can mark down the ones you want us to look at, and we can see, we can investigate. Sure. Yeah. And it, feel feel free when these things pop up as you're reading the board packet to to call right away. Yeah, I didn't. You know what? Meeting. I looked it over, but then I didn't dig into the details until. Uh, Unfortunately, I didn't dig through all these details until later on today, and I was like, oh, crap, oh, well. Well, that's, I, I, that's pretty impressive. You notice the different prices between Elmer's Blue, so that's... <laughs> I was shopping this at, right before the board meeting. Yeah, I was getting school supplies I, <laughs> for, my, for my four kids. And <laughs> uh, okay, so we need... Further discussion? Roll call? Further discussion? Further discussion at all? So we had to... Uh, Look into this before we vote on it, or uh? Uh, we can't. I would recommend not. Uh, we'd like to get the this going. We've analyzed these. I can tell you why that if you give me the specifics that sure. you're looking into, I can tell you uh, more information after we do some research. But um, I I think we can still go ahead and approve this if if you're not comfortable, then we can put it off. But I think the business department has pretty thoroughly analyzed this. Okay. What, what happens with the amounts that are no bid by the selected vendor? 
So if, if it's no bid by the vendor and so the school especially didn't do a no bid on it, then if a, a building could go to like logs and then order it from whoever they want to buy by. Okay. Staples, something in order. Staples, logs then, whoever. Amazon. So are these prices all locked in or are these, uh, or is this just we're selecting the vendor? We're selecting the vendor, but they also gave us a percentage discount, their, their basic percentage discount on, on that basket of items. So those prices would be locked into the whole school year. The unit cost. So is this part of the contract then? So it's like these are the prices we're going to be paying? This, this would be a contract for one year only, yes. But I mean these prices are part of the contract? Correct, yes. Okay. I mean, I think this needs to be resolved before we approve it, if this is part of the contract. So do we just award $500,000 and then we order supplies up to that dollar point, or are we ordering specifically everything on here and the quantities so on here? So we're ordering, you would be approving to let us order those, well, all, those items from school specialty. We're estimating that cost to be 500000 We don't know because we don't know what the buildings will order throughout the whole school year. So, our, so we have to estimate with the, with the dollar. So unlike like when we do like custodial supplies, we're saying we're going to buy X quantity of, of trash bags or seafold towels. <laughs> for cleaning solvent for the, for the floor. We, you know, we know what we're going to buy during the school year. But again, we're estimating what's going to be used throughout the whole school year. Sometimes you, more glue is used in one year than the other because there's glue from the prior year. We don't know if they're going to use white, you know, if they're going to use different colors of finger paint. The reason we've done that is we've had a lot of product go bad on the shelves throughout the year. Maybe, like, I, I know it's happened with construction paper. Maybe brown construction paper has been used for one, you know, for, uh, for the curriculum in one year, that changes, and we've got cases and cases of brown construction paper on the shelf that sits there for years and years and years, or paint goes bad, or glue goes yeah, bad. Yeah, I think the just-in-time delivery, delivery is really good. I think that's great. I'm just wondering if these are our contract prices that we're locked into, or is this just, you know, what they sent back as their bid, and this could, we could still go back to them and say, hey, we went back through your bid here, and, and something seems off. Can you please look into this? Or is this like, that's it, we're stuck. We're going to be paying $36 a bottle for Elmer's glue. Yeah, I'd be highly surprised if that's $36 for a bottle of glue. I'm just saying, so in the, the contract, question is, right, ultimately, the other thing if is, it's a one-off, can do we have the option to communicate the one-off and have them buy, adjust? We're not obligated to buy Elmer's glue from them if we don't want to. This is just the price that they provided us. Yeah, we encourage them to buy, but in what a lot of buildings do, if they go to Amazon and find it cheaper on Amazon, then they'll buy it on Amazon as well. Okay. So, so if we vote for this, we're not locking into these prices here. Are you saying maybe they can put these high prices on here because it was a form of like, you know, they didn't want to really bid on it? I mean, I don't know. Is that high, is that high price? I'm not looking at it. Is that high price from school specialty? Yeah, it's in the, the last column there. Last week, school specialty. If it doesn't get approved tonight, then we could possibly be short on some of these school supplies for the side of the school year. We've got some in the warehouse. We were also hoping to supplement what's not in the warehouse with the business plan. Maybe there are three other bids for that one. What's that? There are three other bids for that one. Yeah. There's a bunch of other bids. I mean, we got what? They, they bid it out to, well, one guy didn't vote, bid it all. That was ACO. But, uh, you know, Office Depot, Treehouse, Copy Technologies, Standard Stationery, and SS Worldwide. So, I don't know. What? If we can get it's just more, it wasn't just dollar thirty two, and we're not going to pay thirty six dollars if that's the price on there. So oh, we God. we will definitely adjust that. But I think I'd encourage the board to approve this tonight so that kids have school supplies that they need in their art classes and other places for the school year to begin. It looks like there were only a couple of vendors that actually bid on the vast majority of these of these items. Most of them had no bid, so it essentially wasn't really a bid for the program that the administration felt we wanted to go to. You can't have a just-in-time program if you are only able to provide two of the supplies on our list. So, I mean, really, it's re it, so this is really between two or three of these vendors that even were able to provide the vast majority of what, of what we've put on this list. Yeah, I mean, it looks like Office Depot handled most of it, and then School Specialty, and then uh, Standard, Standard Stationery. Stationary. Mm -hmm. So those three seem to be done most of the bidding. It's out of those three companies. Can I ask a question? Having a tremendous number of years of experience running the PTA school supply program at Paddock, um, 
with staples. What I found my experience with that was there were many times that what was on our list, the items specifically on our list from D15, when I was trying to get a bid from staples to fulfill those items, they might not have the exact item. And that might be brand specific or it may be size specific. And so staples would refuse to fulfill my initial request. So if I provided them with a spreadsheet and it said 0.28 ounce glue sticks, but they don't carry 0.28 ounce glue sticks, they only carry 0.64 ounce glue sticks, they would not bid. And then I would have to go through over and over again making adjustments to what they carried in their line versus what my initial thought was based on our supply list. In the end, we got the supplies we needed. We got them at a fair price, but they might not have bid every line item. Um, and I don't think that that's uncommon. Um, I ran that program for eight years, so if, uh, I, mean, I think at least we, as long as we have options, if there's a particular item in the course of a year that's being is unre you know is unreasonable, and we can opt out of that and, and buy it from somewhere else, it looks like the. I mean, my perspective on this was that we have a significant discount that's being offered, um, and this uh, the manufacturer discount of 35%. So I kind of compare that discount over the three, yeah, the three different vendors that are actually providing a competitive bids or. I guess uh, uh, bids that, that fit with you know what we're trying to the, the, the items that we need. So this is the one that has the, the the largest manufacturer discount, despite the fact that some of the items seem to be more expensive. Who does the actual purchasing? If we if we put this in the schools' hands and allow them to you know manage their own just-in-time inventory, are there people who will be trained in, in purchasing techniques and looking across vendors and things in case they can find a cheaper price on Amazon or so what we'll do on this is we'll say this is the vendor, this is our approved vendor for school supplies. Now that's because we bid that out and the school closes over twenty five thousand dollars, so that's where we want the majority of our purchases to be. Now knowing that the building's doing on an annual basis because they have uh, they have P cards and purchase orders, they'll go online to look at Amazon. If they look for example and see that they can get it cheaper, and the buildings are very good at that. They get something cheaper on Amazon. A lot of times, a lot of their all they will order it off Amazon. Mike, do we put? Are we putting out like as as we're talking about this, where we've got an agglomerated sum of purchasing power, but then a 35 percent discount after the fact? If things are priced at a dollar instead of at 65 cents, does our staff know that the real end cost is 65 cents? because of the benefit of the collective purchasing power and therefore the rebate? Or will they be looking at a, you know, their sum total of a dollar per item and say, oh, no, we're better off buying it from Amazon for 80 cents when the reality is we just lost 15 cents? No, what they would do, so the prices that we have here, that would be loaded into our, into our interface with, with school specialty. So when they log into school specialty, they would see that price that school specialty offers in the district. Inclusive of rebate. Inclusive of, of the rebate or the discount. And I'm looking through here. Are we noticing any erroneous numbers that only have one bid? So the ones, so I, Frank, what you mentioned, some numbers that just looked just different, uh, you know, bid to bid. But are we noticing anything that stands out with just one bid? Because that would be my my concern. Well, yeah. I mean, some of the numbers are significantly higher than the other bids. That, that's why they they stood up. Well, first I just looked for the large dollar amount ones, and then I kind of scanned across to see if they were all similar. And that's when I would see ones that were really high, and I was like, ooh. I mean. I would just hate to think that somebody would be, you know, if a teacher's just going through and having to buy stuff and they check it off and just submit it, and then some of these items are on that list and they buy a bunch of, you know, whiteboard markers at you know, 10 50 a piece, that, that would be kind of bad. I mean, it's a way to limit stuff that's obviously extremely high. So I mean, well, people well, don't the one you're, 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 you were mentioning about the Elmer's glue, yeah. Is that line at 11, 110067 or 110069 or 110070? Uh, let's see, that was line 69. 69, six, six, nine. Six, nine. yeah, so 69 six, nine. So six, nine is for, uh, uh, they're, they're, they're different because one of them says, one of them says, uh, says 0.8, I guess, I mean, uh, 
that's just got to be a mistake because it looks like one of them is <laughs> well, that's what I'm asking. Like, 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 is this just a mistake? They're or? describing four, it says 48 per case, so they have four ounce bottles, 48 per case. One of them is you know 36 dollars, um, and the other one is is 30, 68 cents. Yeah. So to me, one of them is just describing yeah. it most likely on a per bottle basis. One of them is describing on a, on a, a, the whole case. That's what I would guess. Yeah, and that might be very well the case. I'm just saying, if this is a contract that we're signing off on, this is like, yeah, this is the price we're going to be paying. I just want to make sure the contract's correct. That's all. Yeah, but well, we would verify that ahead of time. So when, when we summarize this, what we're showing you is how they bid it. So they may very well, probably what they did is instead of putting a per bottle price on it, they put a per case price on it. So then when we get that, then we've got to break it down to the per bottle. That'd be fine. It's just I just want it to be clarified. Yeah. That's all. That we don't sign off on, a, on something that, that the contract's incorrectly written. And yeah, I mean, if you multiply that 68 cents by 48, it's coming out to 32 dollars and 64 cents. 34 dollars 64 cents is still lower than the 36 dollars, but maybe not as bad. There's a number of items like that. I mean, the first several lines are construction paper. That's a couple bucks at many of the bids and. 30, 40 bucks on some of these, so it could be quantity, but it's it looks like that's it's what unclear what's, what's been done. Maybe we Which, yeah, it might be the case, and that's what I was guessing. It might be the case. It's just it probably should be fixed if there's anything in a contract. Which I don't. Like I said, I don't know if these prices are in a contract or not, or how things are written that we're actually signing up for. That's all I'm saying. If it's yeah. if that's the case, then we probably should fix it. Yeah, we we think, but what we want to do is to show you. Well, like we do on any bid, even if it's an erroneous bid and they they, they bid it erroneous and we don't award it on an erroneous bid, we still if always and not only on this bid but every other bid that we've done, shown the board exactly what the companies bid uh, based on their bid sheets. And we've done the same thing on construction projects. Too. And then we interview the we interview the company if they've made a bid on it. We leave the erroneous bit on there, we just don't award it to that company. So when we finalize all this, we would finalize an item like that and say, is that your price per bottle or is that your price per case? Okay, so we're still going to go back that. and talk to him about it and fix it? And make sure that the correct one gets into the system, yes. Okay, as long as we do that, then, you know, that's fine. I just want to make sure that these things don't slip through, that's all. Further discussion? Vote, roll call. Shupai? Aye. Wong? Aye. In Reno? Aye. Order? Aye. Kane? Aye. Khan? Aye. Smolka? Aye. Motion carries. Item 17A30. You know, before we move on, just real quick, Mike, when you guys verify, can you just shoot us a note that, uh, that you've verified so that everyone feels comfortable with that. Thank you. Um, item 17830, the consent calendar. There are 28 items. Would anyone like to remove anything from the consent calendar? If um, I'm taking that as a no. Um, may I have a motion, please, to approve the consent calendar as it stands? I make a motion to approve the consent calendar as presented. Second. Roll call. Long. Aye. Anarino? Aye. Order? Aye. Kane? Aye. Khan? Aye. Smolka? Aye. Shupai? Aye. Motion carries. Dr. Thompson, correspondence? Yes, we had three requests and or responses for information under the Freedom of Information Act during the period of June 8th through August 3rd. On May uh, 26, 2017, a request received from Janie Jordan, Data Research Partners, LLC, Las Vegas, Nevada. Responses request was sent on June 17th. On June 7th, request received from Michael Wee, Hoffman Estates, Illinois. The response to this request was sent on June 14th. And on June 12th, the request received from Gabriella Lu Luricella, Smart, Cure, Smart Procure, Deerfield Beach, Florida. Uh, the response to this request was sent on June 19th. We did receive two checks from municipalities, uh, one from Rolling Meadows in the amount of $1,730, and one from the Village of Palatine in the amount of $16,065.26. Thank you. Um, any other items? If not, I'd like a motion to adjourn. 
So moved. Second. I second. second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The meeting is adjourned.